Aging is one of these universal things. And what really is remarkable that we've learned uh, in my lab over the last 20 years is that the same genes that control aging in yeast work in worms and flies, mice, and even humans. We didn't know that 30 years ago. Now we know that there's a fundamental set of genes that controls how fast we live. And then we can also exploit that to slow down our own aging now. And as we'll get to later, we can use that knowledge to even reverse the aging process. I mean, the old theories about aging, you got to throw them out. Most people at parties will tell you, oh, antioxidants, free radicals, DNA damage, or mutations. That is all, for the most part, incorrect. Why is it that having elevated blood sugar, glucose, and insulin ages us more quickly? And or why is it that having periods of time each day or perhaps longer can extend our lifespan? Well, let's start with, with what I think was a big mistake, was the idea that people should never be hungry. We live in a world now where there's at least three meals a day, and then we've got companies selling bars and uh, snacks in between. So the feeling of hunger, almost, some people never experience hunger in their whole lives. It's really, really bad for them. Um, it was based, I believe, on the 20th century view that you don't want to stress out the pancreas uh, and you try to keep insulin levels pretty steady um, and not have this, this fluctuation. What we actually found, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, across this field of longevity, is that when you look at, first of all, animals, whether it's a dog or a mouse or a monkey, the ones that live the longest, by far, 30% longer and stay healthy, are the ones that don't eat all the time. Um, it actually was first discovered back in the early 20th century, but people ignored it. And then it was rediscovered in uh, the 1930s. Clive McKay did caloric restriction. He put cellulose in the food of rats so they couldn't get as many calories even though they ate. And those rats lived 30% longer. But then it, it went away and then it came back in the 2000s in a big way when a couple of things happened. One is that uh, my lab and others showed that there are longevity genes in the body that come on and protect us from aging and disease. The group of genes that I work on are called sirtuins, there's seven of them. And we showed in 2005 uh, in a science paper that if you have low levels of insulin and another molecule called insulin-like growth factor, those low levels turn on the longevity genes. One of them that's really important is called SIRT1. And, but by having high levels of insulin all day, being fed, means your longevity genes are not switched on. So you're falling apart, your epigenome, your information that keeps your cells functioning over time just degrades quicker. Your, your clock is ticking faster by always being fed. Okay. Um, the other thing that I think might be happening by always having food around is that it's not allowing the cell to have periods of rest and, and reestablish the epigenome. And so it also is accelerating in that direction. There's plenty of other reasons as well that are not as profound, such as um, having low levels of glucose in your body will trigger your major muscles in your brain to become more uh, sensitive to insulin and suck the glucose out of your bloodstream, which is very good. You don't want to have glucose flowing around too much. And that will ward off type 2 diabetes. So hunger, of course, is associated with low blood glucose and low insulin. Do you think there's anything about the subjective experience of hunger itself that could be beneficial for longevity? Yeah, I, I do. Um, though you get used to the feeling of not eating. So I'm kind of screwed that way. It's like cold water. You eventually adapt. You, you get used to it, unfortunately. But there, there are some studies that are being done at the National Institutes of Health that are able to simulate the effect of hunger, but still provide the calories. And it's looking like there's a, a small component that's due to hunger. But most of it actually is because you've got this, these periods of not being fed and then the body turns on these defensive genes. Um, there's a really interesting experiment that was published maybe a couple of years ago by Rafael de Cabo down at the NIH. What he did was he took over 10,000 mice and gave them different combinations of fat, carbohydrate, protein. And he was trying to figure out what was the best combination. And then he also cleverly had a group well, two groups, one that was fed all the time or ate as much as they wanted. And the other group was only given food for an hour a day. And it turns out they ate roughly the same amount of calories because of course in an hour, they're stuffing their faces. Uh, it turns out it didn't matter what diet he gave them. It was only the group that ate within that window that lived longer and dramatically longer. So my conclusion is 
and mice are very similar to us metabolically, I think that tells us that it's not as important what you eat, it's when you eat during the day. What is the protocol that people can extrapolate from that? Um, or maybe I should just ask you, what is your protocol for when to eat and when to avoid food? Do you fast? Do you ever fast longer than 24 hours? What do you do and what do you think is a good jumping off place if people want to explore this as a protocol? Well, if there's one thing I, I could say, if I would say definitely try to skip a meal a day. That's the best thing. Does it matter which meal or are they essentially equivalent? Well, as long as it's at the end or the beginning of the day, because then you, you add that to the sleep period where you're hopefully not eating. I think that that's an excellent point. I realize it's a, it's a simple one, but I think it's an excellent one because I think one of the things that people struggle with the most is knowing how, when and how to initiate this so-called intermittent fasting. And the middle of the day obviously is not tacked to the sleep cycle in the same way. So it's much harder uh, as well for many people. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I do. Um, I, I skip breakfast. I have a tiny bit of yogurt or olive oil because the supplements I have need to be dissolved in it. And then I go throughout the whole day as I'm doing right now here with this, uh, this glass of water here. I'm just keeping myself filled with liquids and so I don't feel hungry. Beware that the first two to three weeks when you try that, you will feel hungry. And you also have a habit of wanting to chew on something. There's a lot of physical parts to it. But try to make it through the first three weeks and do without breakfast or do without dinner. Uh, and I, you'll get through it. And I did that most for most of my life, actually. Uh, mainly because I, didn't, I wasn't hungry in the morning. Some people are very hungry in the morning and they may want to consider skipping dinner instead. But I will go throughout the whole day I don't get the crashes of the high glucose and the low glucose. That uh, Anyone who goes, oh man, it's three o'clock, I'm gonna need to sleep. If you do what I do, you, you will not experience that anymore. Because what my body does is it's, it regulates blood sugar levels naturally. My liver is putting out glucose when it needs to and it's very steady and gives me pure focus throughout the day. And I don't have to, even have to think about lunch, I'm just powering through. Essentially, you wanna trick your body into thinking that it's under threat of survival, adversity. You don't want it too much. You don't want to damage your body so that it can actually have the opposite effect. But you want to give it a little bit of fear and it will have great uh, results and give you payback for decades to come. <laughs>